The plant kingdom is vast and much older than humanity. We've relied on it for food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. Now, the use of plants to cure disease has a long and extensive history. As examples, batel peppers have antimicrobial catechols, and poppies contain the painkiller opium. In the Mediterranean, they have cultured olive trees for millennia. The fruit and wood are harvested for food and building materials, and the leaves possess disease-preventing and medicinal properties. Olive leaf extracts have been screened and possess many positive effects on health. They also contain a potent antiviral agent, aloirapine. In light of this knowledge and the ongoing search for additional medicines, what is the antiviral activity that these leaf extracts have? And could this further support reasons why we should be integrating our lives with natural products? Hi folks, my name is Cole, and I have a Master's of Immunology. Today on Investigate, Explore, Discover, we're going to be looking at the antiviral activity of olive leaf extracts. So hang around with me throughout this whole presentation to get all of the relevant background information so we can dive into some exciting experimental results. Plus, there is more information for you in the description below. As I mentioned before, plants have been used throughout history to cure all sorts of diseases. Many medicinal plants are widely studied for their bioactive molecules, which have anti-cancer, anti-oxidative, anti-inflammatory, and antimicrobial activity. Thus, they have broad applications for health. Naturally produced phytochemicals from plants and purified natural products represent a rich resource for novel antivirals. Due in part to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, they have been getting increased attention from the scientific community, which I think is great because we should want to increase the number of tools that we have available to fight disease and combat antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance is a growing concern around the world and is a threat to modern medicine. Due to the rapid mutation rate of viruses, they can develop resistance to current therapies when used against them because of the heavy selection pressure that is applied. This particularly affects immunocompromised patients who rely on these substances to fight infections. This is especially important for an increasingly interconnected world where new diseases emerge, spread, and gain resistance to therapies at an incredibly rapid pace. Olea europea L is more commonly known as the olive tree. The leaf extracts from the variety sativa reduces the incidences of cancer and heart and blood vessel diseases, influences the gut microbial balance, exerts antioxidative, anti-inflammatory, and antimicrobial activity against bacteria, fungi, and viruses. The phenolic compound from olive leaf extracts, known as aloirapine, has a potent impact on infectious mononucleosis caused by Epstein-Barr virus, and also exhibits an antiviral effect on hepatitis virus, rotavirus, respiratory syncytial virus, and parainfluenza type 3 virus. Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV, is a human herpes virus found all over the world. Most people get infected with EBV at some point in their lives, and the most common time to be infected is in childhood. EBV infections in children usually do not cause symptoms, or the symptoms are not distinguishable from other mild, brief childhood illnesses. However, teens and adults infected with EBV can cause infectious mononucleosis, a benign acute lymphoproliferative disease acquired orally and characterized by a primary infection which resolves within two weeks. Relapse phenomenon of EBV and severe complications including airway obstruction can occur for the following 6 to 12 months. Alongside some rarer complications, which can cause meningoencephalitis and Julian barre syndrome. EBV infection also has a well-documented correlation with many cancers, such as Hodgkin's lymphoma, Burkitt's lymphoma, gastric cancer, and nasopharyngeal carcinoma. In the viral life cycle, EBV productively infects and lyses the oropharyngeal epithelial cells and spreads to B lymphocytes, which produce our antibodies. Once the B cells are infected, they are immortalized, resulting in a latently infected state of polyclonal activation. Memory B cells are the main reservoirs for EBV reactivation. This is normally kept under control by cytotoxic T cells. However, under immunosuppression or other stimuli, the immune system can lose control of viral replication resulting in malignancies. When EBV is reactivated, it causes lysis of the latently infected B cells to infect new B cells. This cell lysis is caused in part by the increased production of oxygen radicals. These cause oxidative stress which can cause a radical chain reaction known as lipid peroxidation. This phenomenon damages cell membranes and lipoproteins and is cytotoxic as well as mutagenic. The detoxicant action of some compounds counteracts the oxidative stress 
and saturates the overproduction of proton radicals by hydrogen donation. This process, known as radical scavenging action, is an important neutralizing property of antioxidants. Now, in our search for reliable antiviral compounds to broaden our repertoire and combat the threat of antiviral resistance, we should leave no stone unturned and understand the mechanism of action of products that have known antiviral activity. I want to take a moment and really highlight why research on plant-based antiviral compounds is so important. Identifying natural phytochemical combinations could lead to a previously underutilized wealth of medicines, and obtaining additional antiviral compounds ensures that we will not run into resistance problems, allowing us to continually fight viral infections, whatever state we may be in. Additionally, understanding the mechanism of antiviral action enables safe administration of treatments in conjunction with other therapies. If you also think that these are some important reasons to research this topic, go ahead and tap the like button. This brings us to the paper that we are focusing on today. This paper is called In Vitro Anti-Epstein-Barr Virus Activity of Alea Europea L Leaf Extracts by Ben Amore from the University of Messina in Messina, Italy. In this paper, the authors aim to investigate the antioxidant and antiviral activities of olive leaf extracts from the Sfax region, which is in the southeast of Tunisia. First off, the antioxidant capacity of Alea Europea L variety sativa, abbreviated as OESA, or OSA, was determined. The first method used was a DPPH assay, which is the most common assay used for plant extracts. When in the presence of an antioxidant, this causes the solution to turn yellow. As a control for this experiment, the potent antioxidant compound butylated hydroxytoluene, or BHT, was used. This compound can be produced by certain fungi and phytoplankton, but has been commonly used as a preservative ingredient in some foods, though not so much as of late. The authors normalized the amount of radical scavenging to a maximal effect of BHT. This compound had a maximal inhibitory concentration of 0.09 mg per mil, which means that 0.09 mg per mil is required to inhibit 50% of the assay. Now, OSA showed a striking anti-radical activity, capping out at 84% of BHT at its highest doses. Meanwhile, the concentration that OSA can scavenge 50% of the free radicals was at 0.1218 mg per mil, which is very similar to BHT, suggesting that it has antioxidant activity. To further verify these results, the authors also used a ferric-reducing antioxidant powder assay. The FRAP assay measures the ability of the sample to reduce the ferric form of iron to the ferrous form of iron. This redox-linked colorimetric reaction produces an intense blue color, which I'm sure is very pretty to look at. As a control for this assay, the authors used ascorbic acid, which is more commonly known as vitamin C. Vitamin C is found in many citrus fruits and is known to have potent antioxidant activity. In similar fashion, the authors normalized the amount of radical scavenging to a maximum effect of ascorbic acid, which had a half maximal inhibitory concentration of 0.03 megs per mil. When comparing the activity of OSA, the authors found that its reducing power capped out at 90% of ascorbic acid. The concentration that OSA can scavenge 50% of the free radicals is at 0.057 megs per mil, almost double the amount of vitamin C. But Honestly, at those concentrations, the values match pretty closely. To determine whether the OSA antioxidant activity at the aforementioned concentrations would be safe for consumption, the authors next investigated its toxicity. To do this, they used Raji cells. Raji cells are derived from the B lymphocytes of an 11-year-old Nigerian Burkitt's lymphoma male patient in 1963 by R.J. V. Pulvertap. The Raji cell line is latently infected with Epstein-Barr virus, and categorized as lymphoblast-like. Now, these are the cell toxicity levels seen from the different concentrations of OSA in Raji cells. A moderate cytotoxic effect was seen at 0.625 megs per mil. So to reduce the amount of toxicity the cells experience and still be effective based on the antioxidant activity, the authors decided to use 0.31 megs per mil of OSA for experiments going forward. Now, EBV reactivation is known to cause cell lysis and increased levels of oxygen-derived free radicals. To reactivate and induce the lytic cycle in Raji cells, the authors used a non-stressing dose of the reagent TPA to reactivate latent EBV. Lipid peroxidation is a reaction to oxidative degradation of polyunsaturated fatty acids 
commonly found in the cell wall, mediated by oxygen-derived free radicals. A final product of this process during oxidative stress is MDA and other products. Conjugated dienes are carbon chain double bonds that are separated by a single bond, and they are some of the other byproducts of lipid peroxidation. To measure the damaging effects of EBV reactivation, the levels of MDA were first measured. When TPA was given to Raji cells, this caused just over around 325 nanomoles per milligram of MDA secretion. When OSA was added to this mix, this caused a statistically significant reduction in lipid peroxidation. Though, to my eyes, this reduction seems pretty small. To further confirm the role of OSA to reduce lipid peroxidation, the authors also looked at conjugated diene levels. Just like before, TPA was administered to Raji cells to reactivate EBV. This caused an increased presence of conjugated dienes. The author's data shows that there is a significant reduction in conjugated dienes when OSA is added to the cells. Though, again, I think that this reduction is modest at best. But to further characterize the OSA activity on the EBV lytic cycle induction, the authors looked at the percentage of cells that actually lice. The percent positive fluorescent cells indicates how many cells have died. TPA does not cause death in HeLa cells because, well, they're not infected with EBV. The addition of TPA to Raji cells, however, causes around 75% cell death. When adding OSA to the Raji cells, this dropped the percentage of lice cells to around 50%. So the incremental decreases in oxidation correlates to a functional protection of the cells. To quickly summarize everything all together, the authors created olive leaf extract from olive trees in the Sfax region in Tunisia and tested it for its antioxidant ability. They found that it had comparable activity to known effective antioxidants. The authors also found a safe dose for OSA to be given to cells, which correlated with the effective antioxidant dose. And when applied to the cells with reactivated EBV, there was a decrease in Epstein-Barr virus-induced peroxidated lipid radicals, and a reduction in the amount of cells being lysed, thus suggesting that OSA can counter Epstein-Barr virus-induced cell lysis by exerting antioxidant effects. Not only do I think that the antiviral activity from natural compounds is exciting to investigate and learn about, it's also significant in a broader context. This information is significant because it implicates that OSA could be used as a preventative treatment and for deactivation of Epstein-Barr virus due to the virus's association with oxidative stress. As well, identifying and outlining the activity of plant-derived treatments gives us increased tools and a greater understanding of how to fight infections, allowing us to know how this type of medicine will interact with others. If you were listening in the introduction, which I know you were, this information seems to have been alluded to before. And in light of the reproducibility crisis that science is facing, this information is also key because good science is repeatable by multiple sources. All science, though, is basically a stepping stone for new knowledge. And these steps are driven by questions. And I had a few questions myself after reviewing this information. When creating a leaf extract, there are multiple chemicals that are distilled and present. My first question is if there is one particular chemical, like a loyropine, that is facilitating the antiviral activity seen here? Or perhaps is it the unique blend of all of the chemicals together that causes the antiviral activity? Like some sort of intelligent natural design. Now prior research has shown that olive leaf extract has been shown to have antiviral effects in vitro for multiple viruses. So how many viruses exactly is OSA effective against? And can its antioxidant capacity be applied to other forms of infection, like from bacteria or fungi? The highest antioxidant potential of olive leaf extract is from the Agrelia variety in Greece. So linking these two ideas together, does this mean that that variety would theoretically have more antiviral activity than the variety seen here from Tunisia? And how does the antiviral activity of other olive tree leaf extracts compare to one another? As always, though, my final question revolves around you. What sort of ideas or questions popped into your head when hearing about this information? I would love to hear about them in the comment section below. Also, let me know if there are any topics that you'd like to hear about in the future. Ultimately, I hope that you learned something. But more importantly, I hope you enjoyed your time doing so. If you did, give this video a like and subscribe for more in the future. Well, that's everything for today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.